Do you know what your pelvic floor is? Do you know how important it is, not only to your sexual health, but your overall health? I'll bet you don't. I'll bet you don't know as much as you could know. My mind was blown with this interview. I interviewed Dr. UC, Dr. Yuchenna Osai. She works for, I think, the University of Chicago and University of Texas, and she is a pelvic floor physical therapist, and she is a ASEC certified sex therapist. She has so many accolades and titles, and I doubt there are many people on this planet who have the experience and the knowledge that she does, especially regarding women's reproductive health. You're going to learn a lot from it. You'll probably have some women in your life that you want to share this with. And if you learn a lot from it, I would appreciate it if you just hit her up on a little Instagram or leave a comment or a review on the show on iTunes and just say, hey, I loved Dr. UC. I learned a lot from her. I'm sure she would appreciate that. I'll screenshot those comments and send them over to her. And that'll probably mean a lot to her. Hope you enjoyed today's episode. It literally could be life changing. Okay, guys, enjoy. Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome back to the podcast. Today, I have Dr. Can I call you just Dr. UC or do you want me to say your yes. full name? Dr. Yuchenna no. Osai? Yuchenna? Yes. Perfect. Is that right? Osai. Perfect. Osai. Perfect. Awesome. Yes. I should have asked before we started. <laughs> um, perfect. You nailed it. You nailed it. Dr. UC is perfect. Thank you. Uh, so we're with Dr. UC. She's a sex positive pelvic, he pelvic health physical therapist, a sex educator, and a counselor, and is on the faculty at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. She is one of three licensed physical therapists in the world with an ASEC, certified, uh, ASEC certification in sexual counseling, as well as the only black physical therapist with this specific designation. Freaking amazing. Um, she spends her days treating people with both sexual and pelvic floor dysfunction and, her evenings and spends her evenings educating the masses on everything that has to do with sexy times. So when it comes to sexual intelligence and great sex education, UC embraces always being unapologet unapologetically real, happily crunk, and deliciously kind. And I got to say, from the few times that we've spoken, that is the most accurate uh, bio that I think I've ever read. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'm so stoked to have you here. So you, you carry these two titles of being a pelvic floor uh, uh, physical therapist and a sex therapist. That is so rare. Well, I mean, what's uh, interesting. Yeah, go oh, ahead. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, you, you, you. It's interesting because, you know, when I became a pelvic health physical therapist, well, well let me say when I started to become a ther physical therapist, I just really wanted to treat pelvic floor disorders amongst all genders. And then as I became more skilled in my profession, I was like, I don't know much about how to counsel my patients through sexual health. And so that's when I got interested in getting more didactic training and formal training and becoming a sexuality counselor. And so being able to have those two, those two titles under my name is really exciting because it really benefits my patients the most. Oh, I can imagine. Fun, so a lot of people might be thinking, okay, why do you have a pelvic floor physical therapist on this show? Like, what does this have to do with marriage? And I got to tell you, it, you'll be surprised. So I want to just throw it back at you. What are some of the problems that you see your patients bumping into fairly regularly that you're like, oh man, I just wish more people understood this. Well, I, one thing I want everyone to understand is that we all, all of us, men, women, everyone in between, have a pelvic floor. Mm. And particularly when we're talking about women or vagina owners, uterus owners, pelvic floor disorders occur in one in four women in the country. One in four. I have my shocked face on. That's... Right? Um... You have it, you do have your shock. Yeah. On. So what are is, I didn't know that. What are some of the disorders yeah. that they bump into? Absolutely. So urinary incontinence, so inability to hold your bladder, fecal incontinence, inability to control your bowels, pelvic organ prolapse. So either your uterus, your uh, bladder, or your rectum is falling down through the vaginal opening or the rectal opening. You can have chronic constipation, which I know everyone's like, oh, everyone's a little constipated. No, having chronic constipation, or these, these are the individuals who say that they have a bowel movement every four to eight days or 10 days, right? That's, I know, you're making That's a not surprise very space. <laughs> not very frequent at all, but can you, if you can imagine, you know, four, eight days of stool, is there going to be a lot of space in the vaginal opening or the vaginal canal for penetration? No. No. 
right? And that can be really uncomfortable. Plus, if you're bloated, you're bloated and you don't feel very sexual. Okay, so a lot of people, it sounds like a lot of people facing these issues are probably going to be experiencing some pain during intercourse or... Absolutely. Or, Absolutely. or un- discomfort, maybe some psychological, like, tension and, and nervousness or anxiety... Absolutely. You know, a lot of times I treat people who have pain with intercourse, endometriosis, fibromyalgia, vulvodynia. And so over time, if every time you attempt to have sex and it's painful or uncomfortable, or you are not able to have an orgasm or it's not pleasurable, that can really take its toll physically, but emotionally, not just for you, but also your partner. So one thing that people don't realize or they're not really educated on is that let's say one in four women have pelvic floor disorder, right? Right. So what we found is that 80 to 90% of women who have pelvic floor disorders have sexual dysfunction specifically. What? And yes. So their partners. Is it correlation or causation? uh, Both. Okay. So they're, okay, got it. Keep going. Right? Both. It's not happenstance. It's not just like, oh, that's a total coincidence. It's actually a lot of the sexual dysfunction is becoming, is a result of these issues. Exactly. So let's, let's do a case example, right? So if I have urinary incontinence, which is very common, right? Very, very common. A lot of times people think it's a rite of passage when they have a baby. It's a common problem, but it's not normal. So I'm going to say that again. It is a common problem, but it is not normal. Hmm. Right. And so some women have it more severe. So they have to wear diapers. If you can imagine wearing diapers and you think you smell like urine all the time, is your libido or your sexual motivation going to be high? No, no. Right. And that's going to impact your relationship and you might be embarrassed. So you may not communicate the real reason of why you don't want to have sex to your partner and your partner doesn't know. So they just think that you aren't into them or you just don't like sex. And then the two of you, there, that divide between the two of you gets greater and time passes. And then we have profound sexual dysfunction and, you know, most commonly sexual desire discrepancy where one person wants sex more often than the other. Right. And so that's, that happens most of the time when, when I see my clients and patients, that's what I'm seeing is that they've had profound pelvic floor disorder, haven't communicated it to their partner or they have, and their partner doesn't quite understand because what ends up happening is when you have sexual dysfunction, your partner develops sexual dysfunction. So they start to develop erectile issues, desire issues, performance anxiety. That can be a real thing for your partner. So it's almost the gift that keeps on giving. Yeah. The, the worst gift that keeps on giving. The worst gift. <laughs> How many people do you think struggle with some of these issues and don't even realize it? Oh my. So many? So many. I, oh. I, you know what, you know, it really, um, frosts my cookies. I say that, but it really, I'm just what chaps chaps. your hide, what chaps my hide is when I see people who've been married to their partner for 15 plus years, 20 plus years. And they say to me, I've always had pain with sex. I just thought that was normal. I know it's like, Oh, Oh no. (laughs) It should be a pleasurable experience. And if it's not, That's when you call Dr. UC and she'll yes. show you the way. Yes. Okay. It's, yes. This, this is like, okay, you're hitting on a nerve because I, mm-hmm. I love discovering things that can change people's lives and they have no idea or they've just resigned themselves to this is just the way life is. And yes. you're totally hitting that, that like spot for me. I'm just really yes. excited about this. <laughs> so if you're okay, I want to, can I pull back a little bit? Yes. And Please. for somebody who's, 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 kind of hearing this stuff for the first time and is going, what the heck is a pelvic floor? And (laughs) what does this have to do with me having painful sex or like um, peeing my pants after I have a baby or something like that? Can you just describe kind of what the, what the pelvic floor is and why it's important? Yes. So we all have a pelvis, right? So if everyone puts their hands on their hips, they're going to feel the bone and at the, in between your legs, right? The muscles between your legs, your undercarriage, Those are the muscles of your pelvic floor. So it starts at your pubic bone, like right at the front, like right Uh at the lower part of your abs and goes all the way back, wraps around the penis or for for women, the urethra, the vagina, the anus, and then attaches to your tailbone, right? So your pelvic floor is like a hammock of muscles that holds up your organs. And its responsibility is for urination, defecation, sexy time, and for uterus owners and women, babies, and defecation, right? So we all have it. 
And sometimes, sometimes some people are born with pelvic floor issues. So some people have what we call primary pelvic floor disorders. So the minute they start their menses, things are just not working well. But then uh, most of us acquire those issues secondary. So after childbirth, after a surgery, you know, after a fall, or if you have chronic back pain, because that's another thing that people don't understand is that your pelvic floor is a loyal gangster to your pelvis and your back. So if your back isn't acting right, your pelvic floor is gonna compensate or decompensate to accommodate. Same thing with your hips. So they're all, it gets all one big happy family down there. And it's yeah. really difficult to treat. So the average time it takes for someone who initially presents with a pelvic floor issue or a sexual dysfunction issue is three years. So if you think about that in a relationship, if you've started to see sexual issues and it takes three years for you actually to get properly addressed, that's three years of potential damage that has caused in their relationship, mm -hmm. you know, and not understanding what's going on with your body. And that can be a lot of turmoil individually for the person, but as a couple. Wow. So like I, the, the idea here is essentially like when something goes wrong within that pelvic floor area, that hammock full of muscles that keeps all mm -hmm. of your organs and everything intact, mm -hmm. like it can, it doesn't just have health repercussions. It has relationship repercussions. It has psychological repercussions. Like the, the consequences of ignoring your, your pelvic floor health can be ongoing and kind of like dominoes. They just, cascades more and more and more problems until you start to fix it. Absolutely. That's, Absolutely. that's intimidating. So, um, can it you, is. so as the pro here, yes, what are some things yes. people should be thinking about thinking about doing? And maybe we can talk about like, let's talk about one specific problem. Sure. And, sure. and give some tips for that. And then, um, maybe if we decide to do another episode, we can dive deeper into another episode, but, or another topic. But my, my goal here is like to pinpoint, to give some people some action items. Like it's really good to teach them the philosophy here and, the, and the theory and the principles behind it. But I'd really like to have, we'll have people walk away with some, some practical application as well, especially if they're dealing with some of these issues. Absolutely. So one thing I will say before we pick like a, a fun oh, yeah, for like sure. one or two um, diagnoses is I want everyone to understand that when it comes to your sex life, right, your sex life is not dependent on your genitals. Okay. It's not a genital dependent thing. So if something's not going right, we still need to develop that sensual energy. Hmm. We still need to develop that sp safe space, right? Because the orgasm is processed in the brain for men and women. For people of all genders. So understanding that if for some reason that the genital area isn't accessible right now, temporarily, there's still your whole body, your whole mind to access. And I want everyone to really kind of just sit with that for a second. Really sit with that. Because the sexuality, I mean, there's so many opportunities to, have, to, to cultivate pleasure Mm -hmm. But I think what really trips people up when they start working with me is that the only place to access pleasure is their vagina, mm. right? Is their penis. And that's actually not true. It's just the place that we all are socially and culturally conditioned to access for pleasure that, but we haven't been given training wheels on how to access any access in any other way. I love that. If that, you know, so I just want to kind of give that little primer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So if you are struggling, like maybe you're experiencing, experiencing some pain right now, or mm -hmm. you're experiencing some struggles and maybe it's hit your self-confidence or it's affecting yourself, so your sex, sex life. There's like, you don't have to rely solely on your genitals to experience orgasm, connection, pleasure, um, and, and a, a really great time. You don't even need your genitals to make love to each other. Absolutely. Because yeah. then if we, if you have that perspective, then it's so much easier to move through the rehab process to address the pain or dysfunction that you're having. I can imagine it takes a lot of stress off of people that so I, need, I need to perform or I need to be doing this specific thing in order for me to have a healthy, happy relationship or not feel broken. And right. as soon as you take that thing off the table, one, you probably get better at fle flexing that brain muscle. Yes. And in accessing pleasure in your brain when you're not relying just on 
this hypersensitive nerve area that is your genitals. Like if you can focus on cultivating that in your brain, that's a great gift to have for when your genitals are accessible. And two, it takes that pressure off of the table of like feeling guilty and ashamed if yes. you're not able to access that right now. Oh, the shame. Oh, the shame is real. So much, so much, so much shame. And it's not just, you know, and I, I'm going to speak to part, I'm going to speak to partners right now because yeah. I think that sometimes when you, when your, your wife or husband, you know, does not, is, is not desiring sex, which we're going to talk about next or has, has pain with sex or has a pelvic floor issue and you, you're not able to access them. There is shame in that you feel guilty. I've seen this before where partners feel guilty for desiring sex, even though it's not what their partner desired. You are entitled to your own sexual needs and desires and, and motivations. Don't feel bad because you, you want to have sex with your partner and they don't. That's completely healthy and normal. Yeah. Right? And, and, you, and I think you feel bad because you love your partner. You don't want to hurt yeah. them or make them feel pressured. Just like your partner doesn't want, wants to have sex with you because they feel like it will be helpful for your relationship, but they don't desire it or they, they, they're not feeling it with their own body. So there, there has to be a middle ground that you both have to meet in order to move forward. Absolutely. And to be able to give each other both grace in that. Yeah, I think it's a really de- delicate balance between not not feeling guilty for wanting it and at the same time not making it about making it about yourself if they don't want it. Yes. I think I think there's the the both kinds of shame. One is the shame of feeling like oh, do I just want too much? Am I expecting too much? You know, am I is this un, un, unnatural or unrealistic? Do I are my expectations too high? And then on the flip side it's like Am I, is there something wrong with me? Did I do something wrong? Am I not attractive enough? Or have I, have I done something in the relationship to make it so my partner doesn't want, like there's so, it's so easy to get sucked into these spirals of shame and self-loathing and self-judgment. Um, and really hard to step back and like take a deep breath and, and just be okay being where you're at. Absolutely. Even if it's in a different place is where your partner's at. Absolutely. Absolutely. So let's talk about the diagnosis, right? Like yes, what, what, what topic? Okay, so I'm, I think we should talk about the most common sexual dysfunction among women in the United States of America. Yes. I don't know why I'm sounding like a preacher. I'm like, oh, America. Because you're a preacher this morning. <laughs> you're dropping the truth. But um, let's talk about female sexual interest and arousal desire disorder, or as commonly known as low libido. Yeah. Right. This is, this is something that a lot of women struggle with. And this is not just everyone kind of named it the, you know, 65 plus disease. That's not the case. This impacts women of all ages, shapes, sizes, races, ethnicities, backgrounds from like 16 to 99. So I first like to tell people how, how do we address it? Right? So we, let's say you've acknowledged that this is a problem, right? Your libido is low. We always want to first go with a medical exam, medical screening, if you have access, right? So that can be a nurse midwife, that can be a family pra- nurse practitioner, a PA, an MD provider. Typically, I would start with a gynecologist or someone that has training in women's health issues, right? So they're first going to just do a physical exam to just rule out if any physical issues are happening, right? So they're going to work that out. And a lot of people ask me about hormones, hormones, hormones. Well, the thing is, if I could draw a picture of what your hormones do on a daily basis, it would be up and down, ziggity zag, right? So sometimes just getting hormone check isn't going to be the best indicator of what's going on with you. Okay. There also, there also has to be, we have to do a physical exam. We need to do hormone check. We need to do blood panel, making sure we're just ruling out any other issues. Now, let's say that everything's perfect, right? And you're like, hey, I still have low libido. So sometimes people, the doctor will say, okay, um, talk to a therapist or drink more wine or (laughs) relax more, right? Because this is what patients say to me. They say that that's what they're told. And when you hear that, are you just like, oh my gosh, come on. I'm like, oh my goodness. The thing is, what we really need to start with is we need to start with educating ourselves, right? Educating ourselves about, what sex means? What is a healthy sex life? And what are your expectations? 
right? Are you expecting to have the libido you had many moons ago? Or did you never really have a high libido and you engage with sex with your partner just to kind of say, I'm in a relationship, right? right? And then after maybe, you know, marriage for a few years, a few kids, you're like, man, I just can't wrap my head around this. We first have to start with what are your expectations of sex, right? Do you just want to desire it more? Do you want to, do you want to feel more pleasure when you have sex, Right. Do you want to be able to like initiate sex? Because that can be an issue for some people where they say, you know, my wife never initiates sex. I always have to initiate sex and it makes me feel like she doesn't want to be with me. Yeah. Lack of spontaneous desire. Right. Which is a huge, huge myth. And we'll get into that later. (laughs) But, But I think that, I think that we first need to start align ourselves with, okay, what are my expectations? And then remembering that even though we're grown, even though we've been potentially been married or partnered for many years, you still need sex education. Yeah. Right? Sex education is like consent. It's continuous and ongoing. I'm and getting some right now. Right? <laughs> sometimes <laughs> we just need to educate yourself about what it is, what, what sex is supposed to look like. Right? And then honestly, please have a conversation with your partner about this. Tell them, I'm struggling. I really want to desire sex more. I find you attractive. I find you beautiful. I, you know, I think you are the cat's meow, right? But for some reason, I'm not responding. And let me say one thing here is that sometimes there is a hormonal component to it. You know, sometimes there are underlying issues that medically need to be addressed. So I'm not saying that that's not, not a thing. It's just, right. I think some, sometimes people just hold on to, I need more testosterone. I need more estrogen, right? Right. But if, if, if there are underlying communication issues, if there are unrealistic expectations, or sometimes like I say, magical sexual thinking, we could give you all the testosterone in the world and it's not going to improve yeah. your, your sex life. I think it's, it feels nice to get a diagnosis like that because then you can, bl- then you can treat it. Yes. Like you can throw a pill at it or an injection or some sort of treatment. But when I think that's why people really like having that di- diagnosis is it can yes. put a label to it. We can address it now that it's, you know, Oh, it's hormone stuff and yes. there's a plan of action. But when it's something that's more subtle um, and that you can't track but w- using a blood lab, um, it poses like a different type of threat. And it feels, I think a little bit more intimidating and scary when it's something psychological or maybe something like mu- in, in, in your muscles, in your, bi- in your physiology that needs to yes. shift. That's different than just like getting a h- hormone replacement or whatever. Exactly. Exactly. And I, you know, I want to say to people and couples that like one of the things, the, one of the first interventions that I start with people is yes, I start with that expectations. I start with sex education, but then I also remind people that you have their, if you're, if you're married, there are three sexualities you have to contend with, right? There are three sexual sex lives. Your partner has their own sexual, sexual self. They have their right to like their sexual individuality, then yours, and then yours as a couple, mm-hmm. right? And people forget that sometimes, especially, especially if you, you haven't had the best sex education or you haven't had a ton of experience prior to, be, prior to being married, it's almost like your sexuality gets fused with your partner. And sometimes I tell people, this is the time to where we kind of not separate yourself, but almost start to take care of yourself by starting to learn what it is that you actually like. Mm, what feels like good to you, right? You know, and I always say pleasure mapping is one of the best things we can do. So pleasure mapping is basically you taking the time. And like, I always tell my patients to draw like a, like a, a person on a sheet of paper front and back. And you just take, and you just get some space for yourself. If you can even give like 15 minutes, just don't do it in the bathroom, like pick a safe space in your house where you can lock the door, you can, play some Sade, light a candle, whatever you need to do, right? <laughs> and, and you just touch, your, touch yourself and you can touch your hand to skin. You can do a feather, you can do oil, whatever, but just touch your face, your shoulders. And the purpose isn't sexual. It's more like, what feels good to me? Wow, this feels natural. This feels, this feels soothing. It's self-exploration, feels self-discovery. Like, yes, exactly. How often exactly. do we consciously 
examine ourselves and like really take a look at, Hey, how, what, what do I want? I think it's, I, I don't know, maybe this, I'm not a woman, so I don't know, but I feel like just from my, pers- from watching so many women that I love and care about, they have a really um, high expectation for themselves to take care of everybody else's needs. And nice. it's very rare for somebody like my, I look at my mom or my wife, you know, to watch them slow down and think, what do I need? And what would I enjoy? And what would I like if they feel guilt around that? And man, it's important. It's so important. It's so important. And I know some people are thinking, I've got three kids at home. I, you know, I got a husband, I got a job, I have this, I have that. How am I supposed to? And I'm like, this is one of the cheapest interventions one of the cheapest non-invasive interventions you yeah. can do to help address the libido. Because at the very least, you're, this gives you, like, figures out, oh, these are the answers to the test. And yeah. then you can literally write this down and talk with your partner and give them the answers to the sexy time test. The that cheat. is you. Yeah. The cheat, cheat. Right? And this can actually be great because you can code different parts of your body. So say, for example, like your neck is always perceived to be a, like a really nice spot for you and your partner always kisses you and you realize during your pleasure mapping, that's actually a red zone. You're like, no, don't touch that. I actually like my elbows to be caressed, right? You can tell your partner, you know what? It feels so amazing when you touch me on my elbow versus telling them, I don't like being touched on my neck. Right. Tell them more of what you them. do want and less, less of what yes. you do want. Right. And so then you, then you have something to work with. Right. And so then if, if it's a matter of, because there are lots of ways this libido thing gets us. Right. So if it's a matter of how you're being touched and approached from that physical aspect, this is a great tool to have. I love that. Another another thing is that people say, well, I just want to be able to like walk, walk down the street and feel desire. Right. And I'm like, okay, so what's going on in your life? Right. Are you working full time? Do you have a bunch of kids? Are you pregnant? (laughs) You know, like all of these. Are you in quarantine? Are you in quarantine? (laughs) Like sometimes it's 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 almost like managing those expectations and saying like, listen, right now you may not have that spontaneous desire, but let's work on that responsive desire. Because sometimes I think people have the misconception that you can only have sex from like if you're like strongly desiring. Right. And most of the time, sex approach from a point of neutrality. You could be folding clothes, and if your partner touches you in the right spot or kisses you on the cheek in a certain way or says a certain thing, or if you come home and the, the house is clean, whatever it is, the things that kind of help quiet the noise. Yeah, or rev up the engine. Or rev up the engine, right? Because depending on where you are in life, in your relationship, whether you have new babies, older babies, right? Like grown kids. Like, depending on what you need on that phase of life, you have to communicate that with your partner, but you also, most importantly, have to communicate that with yourself. I love that. So this is like, this is, this is a really great place to pause for a second. And just for people who are listening, like you just got two really great homework assignments and you could either listen to this podcast and go do the homework assignment and make progress on your own if you're dealing with some of these issues or you could go pay somebody like you see or a sex therapist several hundred dollars to sit in their there and sit in their office and have them tell you the exact same thing just years down the road when you work up the courage to go speak to them like this is a really great jumping off point for a lot of people absolutely Absolutely. And the thing is, you know, some of us, some of you may need to work with a sex therapist, a skilled um, couples, family and couples therapist that really understands like how to help you and your partner navigate communication, especially during these times. Like that is a hundred percent valid and can be extremely helpful. Right. Um, But I also tell people that sometimes we can, you can start you can kind of prepare yourself by doing these activities. You know, and another thing I will say Mm -hmm. is that, you know, the pleasure mapping is a great way to boundary set, right? And the reason I say boundary setting is important, especially if your libido is low, is that sometimes we, you know, what we see in pelvic floor disorders is that 75% of women who have pelvic pain continue to persist with penetrative intercourse, even though it's extraordinarily painful. Mm. And I can't tell you how many times 
my patients will say, well, I just kind of put a pill over my head and wait till my partner is done and then go about my day. So if this is something that's happening all the time, there's, of course, sex is not going to be something that you spontaneously desire, right? And so establishing some boundaries and saying, you know what, I love outer course. Let's do outer course, right? Outer course is still pleasurable. There's no penetration while I'm working in physical therapy to get my pelvic floor issues addressed, mm. right? Because then pleasure is still part of the part of, part of the mix. Everyone gets what they need or desire in that moment, you know, but then like with pleasure mapping, that helps you kind of understand, okay, this is a boundary for me. If, if going towards the general area makes me want to kind of clam up and it's a red zone, then it's like, okay, that's good to know. Then communicate that with your partner. But then keep, then re-up on the pleasure map. Like do it a month later and be like, you know what? It's no longer a red zone. It's a yellow zone. Yeah. And then a month after that, it's green. Thundercats a go. Let's do this. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. And, and then you see the progress. So I don't want you to measure progress on a daily. Measure it from a stepwise incremental process. It can't take several months to get you to a place where you're happy. I love it. That's great, great advice. So let's recap really quick. Yes. Um, specifically with regards to the issue of having low libido. Mm -hmm. There are several things that we can do here. Yes. One, Go talk to somebody who specializes in fe female anatomy, somebody mm -hmm. who understands um, all that stuff. Get your hormones tested, get your blood tested, make sure that everything physiologically is, is going well. Um, and if it's yes. not, address that stuff. Yes. Next, move to psychology. Yes. So one, let's pleasure map. Let's figure out what feels good for you so that you can experience pleasure. Really discover your own body, lock yourself in your room a couple of times and and kind of experiment with different sensations and different pressures and different temperatures and different ways of touching mm -hmm. to see what feels good. So you can communicate to your partner what you want more of and not just what you don't want. Right. Uh, and then the second thing is like really trying to understand, I, well, I know I kind of skipped over this. You talked about goals. Yes. Um, what, make sure you have realistic and clear goals for yourself and that you're not setting a goal that's like, I've never really had a high libido, but I want to have a really high libido. Like maybe it's yes. not in the cards for you, but learn to work with what you've got. Um, and then the other thing that you talked about is like understanding your, sorry, I'm just summarizing everything for you. No, this is perfect. This is perfect. But I just want it's to make perfect. sure that I don't miss anything for our listeners. Yeah. Um, another thing you talked about is like understanding the stressors that are going on in your life that might be contributing to you not feeling that spontaneous desire all the time, being willing yes. to say, Hey, life is just real crazy right now. Maybe because I'm so stressed out and so overwhelmed and have so much going on, my brain isn't just going to go, Hey, you should have sex right now. Maybe what is in the cards for me right now is just responsive desire. It's that when my partner kisses me a certain way or touches me a certain way, uh, I'm going to start feeling more in the mood. And as you can kind of calm down some of the stressors in your life and remove some of those, that spontaneous desire might start to show up a lot more frequently. And it's not a problem Absolutely. with your body. It's a problem. It's not, it's not even a problem, but it's a, it's a situation that is happening more with your brain. Did I, did I do? Absolutely. Yeah, you please. did perfect. You did perfect. That was excellent. I just have one more thing that I forgot. Yes, to add. please. Um, so you can add ten more things if you want. <laughs> the one thing I want to caution you all to be careful of is what people tend to run to is toys. So they say I need to spice things up to get my libido up, and really, we—that's actually not the first thing you should run to. Right? You should run through all the steps that me just described to you. And then as you pleasure map, as you get more comfortable, as you start to understand what your body needs, that's when you can actually really be um, specific about which type of toy you're looking for. Because you know, you know what, I'm trying to elicit this type of pleasure, right? I'm trying, so then I'm going to, you know, go for this, uh, this toy, or I'm going to go for that toy, or I'm going to go for this aid, or I'm going to go for that aid. So that's just one thing I want to caution people about, because a lot of times my patients will say, I spent hundreds of dollars on these things and it doesn't help. And I'm like, because we haven't done any of the stuff that we just talked about on this podcast before you went and purchased all these things and then realized, oh wait, that's actually not what I needed. I love it. We should just make a giant sexual dysfunction decision tree. <laughs> Where we should. <gasps> it starts out with, I'm having a problem. Is it this? Yes or no. And then you just follow the path and it tells you what to do. 
Oh my God, we should do an infographic on it. I love it. Let's make it happen. Yes. <laughs> um, okay, well, thank you for, this is like, I know this is a huge problem that a lot of people deal with and they feel really insecure about and a lot of shame around. And I feel like you've given a lot of clarity. Like, I know one practical thing I'm going to walk away with is I want to focus more on my brain instead of my yes. genitals for uh, pleasure. And it's, yes. it's so easy to get into that mindset of just like, oh, we're, you know, I'm just going to, we're going to follow the same yellow brick road that has always led us to pleasure and stop thinking about where the pleasure is actually coming from. And so that's going to be a challenge that I'm going to um, take on over these next couple of weeks to see if I can cultivate more of that. I think my wife will appreciate it. <laughs> I think everyone should, should definitely think about the brain here. Just remember it's the biggest, it's the biggest organ we got. Well, not the biggest, but it's the, the biggest sex organ we've got. The biggest sex organ we got. Yeah. I love it. Awesome. Well, thank you for dropping by the podcast today. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. It's been Anytime. Fun. If you just walked up to a stranger in the street right now and said, Hey, what do I need to do to make sure that my relationship withstands the test of time, that I have an amazing, amazing relationship? I guarantee you, one of the first things they would say is go on dates together. Everybody knows it. You gotta go on dates if you wanna have an extraordinary relationship. But if you're like most people, your dating life might have taken a bit of a hit lately. Maybe you're not going on as many dates as you were when you first met, or maybe the dates that you are going on are a little bit boring. Maybe you feel like you're stuck in a bit of a rut and you're just kind of doing the same old thing over and over again. If that's the case, I have a gift for you. If you go to getfreedates.com, I am going to send you five free dates. Once a week, you're going to get a date for the next five weeks. And that date is going to include a game plan. I'm going to send you amazing activities. I'm going to send you links to products and games that you can play together. I'm going to send you treats that you can make together or that you can buy and enjoy that you probably have, haven't ever had before. I'm going to send you conversation starters that are questions or topics of conversation. They're going to make sure that, that this date is a connecting experience, that you laugh, that you have fun and that you feel more connected by the end of the date than you did when you began. That is what dating is all about. It's not about the boring routine. It's about implementing some novelty, some surprise, some excitement, and getting to know your partner on a much deeper level. And I am going to send you five of those dates. All you have to do is go to getfreedates.com, type in your name and email address, and I'll send you one date every week for five weeks. I want you to have an amazing relationship and I want you to continue to date each other. And this is my way of helping you out. So just go to getfreedates.com and sign up.